with 128 cores, 256 threads, 500 plus megabytes of cache, 192 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, and super fast DDR5 in 12 channel memory configuration, the Intel Xeon 6 6900P series is absolutely awesome. And make no mistake, this is the highest performance x86 processor on the market today, bar none. We have a ton to go over today, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and this is the brand new Intel Xeon 6900P series, codenamed Granite Rapids AP. Welcome back to Intel. This is the first time in over five years that Intel can say that it has more full performance cores than AMD has on its x86 CPUs. Make no mistake, this is a huge moment enabled by not just getting a bigger processor, but also raising the TDP. These have 500 watt TDP. The other thing though, is that they use brand new Intel process technology. So a ton of innovation had to happen here. There's even support for things like fancy NMR DIMMs that we're gonna talk about soon. Guys, we have a ton to go over here, but before we get too far, I just wanna say thank you to Intel. We're gonna say that they're sponsoring this video. Of course, you're gonna notice that we have an entire development system over here. Now this is really a development system and it just got here a couple days ago. So we didn't get to run our full benchmark suite. At the same time, I do wanna say that we did get a lot of numbers out of this little thing, but we ran into some challenges. Like for example, some of the benchmarks that we run that scale on a per core basis, well, um, when you have 512 threads, they end up going from taking you know a couple of hours to they take over a day. And uh, when you only have a couple of days with the system, that was a little oops that we had. At the same time though, I'm very excited to show you what we have. And so first let's get to when the heck is the Intel Xeon 6 series anyway? And why do we care that this is a 6900P? Now looking behind me real quick, you probably can see some of the magic of the 6900P series. There are three compute tiles plus two IO dies on either side of the chip. Now Intel constructs its chips using chiplets or tiles and it's quite a bit different from how AMD does their chips. And the reason for that is that Intel has two primary types of cores. We just looked at the Intel Xeon 6 Sierra Forest, which goes up to 144 cores in a smaller socket. And while that's all well and good, when you just need a lot of performance in a single socket, that is exactly what this is designed for. So the important things to remember when we talk about Intel Xeon 6 is it's not one processor anymore. In fact, it's two types of cores, but Intel also has two main sockets. Now, there is the big socket, which is this one, and then there's a smaller socket, which we saw with our Sierra Forest 6700E series. And this is a huge and super important aspect to the entire Xeon 6 series, because if you just need a ton of density, well, you can do that in the big socket and Intel enables that. And that's really what they're focusing these high-end chips on. But the idea of having two types of cores and two sockets, well, that is a central concept to the Intel Xeon 6 series. And let me explain why. Now, we always talk about the top end parts, but frankly, most, especially non-cloud customers, aren't buying the really high end 120, 128 core parts. What they're really buying is down the stack. Also, not everybody wants to go and fill up this many memory channels. And there's a lot of things that go into a platform like this that you know folks just don't need a lot of times. But if you don't need the high end density of 288, or 128 cores, then you can get smaller core count CPUs up to 86 cores, all the way down to a smaller series that's only up to 16 cores. Now let's get to some of the features of the Intel Xeon 6900 P series. The number one thing that we've talked about is that this goes up to 128 cores. We'll show you the SKU stack in a little bit, but up to 128. It also supports up to DDR5 6400 memory, but there's a catch because it's only a one DPC design or one DIMM per channel. As you can see that the two processors plus the 24 DIMMs fully goes from one side of the chassis to the other in the system. And so like, there's just not really any room to double the amount of memory. While two DPC is not really an option right now, what is an option is to use MR DIMMs. MR DIMMs is, uh, is a pretty interesting one. Now, if you read our sub stack, you probably kind of realize that the old MCR DIMM standard that Intel was trying to get made uh, that's probably going by the wayside. And you're gonna see all of the materials today talk about MR DIMMs, not MCR DIMMs. The high level is that an MCR DIMM has 
two ranks of memory. It then has a little buffer chip and is able to access both ranks of memory simultaneously. So we get 8,800 mega transfers per second on an MCR DIMM. The MCR DIMMs that Intel has been showing since like 2023, SK Hynix I think showed it in 2022, those things have gotten rebranded as MR DIMMs. But the MR DIMMs, they're faster in this generation, but they're not the JEDEC MR DIMM standard that will be coming out soon. So the idea is instead of having a chip that's like a specific chip with the high bandwidth memory, they are instead saying, hey, use these fancy MCR DIMMs, and if you use those, you're gonna get crazy amounts of bandwidth. Now, MCR DIMMs are not a technology that I would expect most folks to use. However, if you are doing things like high-performance computing or something like that, and you just need a lot of memory bandwidth, I think these things are awesome. Now, let's talk a little bit about the I.O. here. So this system has 192 PCIe Gen 5 lanes. Now, that means that each CPU is contributing 96 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, but there are also six UPI links between the two processors. So those aren't counted as like PCIe, but that's just kind of what you get. Now, AMD can get to 192 lanes. We cover this number of times, but by doing that, you're most likely getting rid of some of the socket to socket bandwidth. So this, you get your socket to socket bandwidth, plus you get your 96 lanes per CPU. Now the CXL 2.0 support, CXL 2.0, I think is where we're gonna start seeing more, I think, adoption than in previous generations. Now, we've been doing CXL content for years on the STH main site. We've shown you things like CXL 2.0 switches, where you can have a ton of different devices on a switched fabric. But the other thing I think is really kind of cool is this. This is an Astero Labs Aurora A1000. And with this little card, you can put up to four DDR5 DIMMs on the card and then plug it into one of the PCIe CXL slots and expand your memory. The other fun thing is that these chips have over 500 megabytes of level three cache, which means that in a two socket configuration, you now have over one gigabyte of level three cache. Now Intel built this chip in a very interesting way. Now on all the slides with the different P cores, E cores, all that kind of stuff, you're gonna see that there are different tile configurations. So there are two IO tiles, plus there are three CPU core and memory controller tiles. The compute dizer tiles are made on Intel three, which is Intel's pretty much newest process, especially until we really see 18A ramp, hopefully next year. But that means that Intel is a lot more competitive on its process technology than it had been previously. Now, something very different between the Intel and AMD architectures is that Intel has its memory controllers on the same die as its CPU core. So if a CPU is saying, hey, we need to go pull something from main memory and bring that into caches and stuff, it doesn't need to go cross to an IO die and then back out. It can just go straight on the same die and just go out to memory. Now, the other die is the Intel IO die. Now, this is made on Intel 7 process and it has things like our PCIe CXL connectivity, our UPI connectivity, and our connectivity, or more specifically, our accelerators that are built in. So for example, if you wanted to go and, you know, encrypt traffic at 800 gigabits per second, you don't have to use CPU cores to do that. You can just use the onboard QAT accelerators that are sitting on this IO die. That's very different because AMD is more like, here's your CPUs and cores and stuff like that, whereas Intel is more on the accelerator path. And the other thing is that by varying the number of compute tiles, that allows Intel to use the same IO dies, but then vary the number of compute tiles to have fewer or more memory and compute. Now, the chips that we have in our system are the Intel Xeon 6980P processors. Now, when we were up at Intel talking about these chips, uh, something I immediately thought with that 128 cores, like, hey guys, uh, if you have 128 cores and you have three compute tiles, that means that, uh, well, 128 is not evenly divisible by like three, right? And the answer is yeah. So one of the compute tiles actually only has, I think like 42 cores. The other ones have 43. But while that headline feature of having 128 cores is all well and good, I think a lot of folks, especially like cloud providers and stuff, are gonna use the 120 core version, which is the 79 SKU instead. That 79 SKU, of course, has three compute tiles of 40 cores each, and so it's all very evenly divisible. It makes a lot of sense. Now, Intel also has 96 core SKUs in either 500 watt or 400 watt TDP flavors. There's also a 72 watt part, but that's it. There's only five different SKUs to this entire SKU stack. And one of the very nice things that I like that Intel is doing this generation 
is that they're enabling everything on all five of those SKUs. Like, thank goodness there's no kind of like, oh, you only get a couple of QAT or DSA accelerators or maybe get lower memory or anything like that. No, you get all of the features on all of the CPUs, which I think is great. And of course, because we have a new generation of processors, we also have a new generation of security technologies. We're not going to go into this, but if you do want to learn about security and RAS updates in this generation, you totally can go do that. There's a lot there and uh, frankly, too much to cover in this video. Okay, so talking about performance, let's start with some just kind of easy stuff. Like the memory bandwidth on these is absolutely killer. It is so much faster than I thought it was. Like we were literally watching the stream runs go and I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is, is much faster than I thought it was gonna be. And we're not even using MCR DIMMs. Our test configuration only has DDR5 6400. So Intel has something very special on a memory bandwidth, but also a memory bandwidth per core basis. But Intel also gave its guidance on how it thinks this performs versus Bergamo and Genoa. Now, of course, Torrent is coming. I know, guys. The fact of the matter is that this thing is going to be faster. There are a couple of reasons. Like, number one, it has a new process technology, which helps it a lot in terms of its overall performance per watt. But you also just get more capacity for more headroom on those 128 cores to go run. And that kind of gives you more performance than AMD has right now. Now, something that we saw when we started running our own workloads is that, like, number one, um, like doubling the core count, that is very, very good for your performance if you're Intel. Uh, also having the new process technology plus higher TDP means that you are running those cores at decent clock speeds so you can get a lot of performance out of it. Well, Intel is showing its performance to AMD now. In previous generations, it would more compare generational performance, but the fact of the matter is that this thing blows away Emerald Rapids. I don't feel bashful saying that at all. It's way faster than Emerald Rapids. But I think this is a huge moment for Intel. By like doubling the performance per socket, they're now in the range where they can actually go out and beat AMD core for core, and that is a big deal. It's something that they really haven't been able to go do all the way up to maximum core counts in a long time, frankly. Like it's been since like 2019 since that was a thing. And it's like five plus years later and they're finally able to do it again. But the performance story is not just about the raw CPU cores and having 128 cores or anything like that. Instead, Intel now has 12 channel memory, finally. So they're able to compete against AMD with the same number of memory channels per socket. At the same time, Intel is bumping their DDR5 speeds all the way up to DDR5 6400, which is pretty darn high. And with the MR or MCR DIMMs running at 8800 mega transfers per second, I mean, this is a absolutely awesome memory subsystem. And don't forget, there's the possibility to add even more bandwidth by going and using CXL memory. Now, we did not get to get to our inference suite, but I'm just going to show you the Intel one real quick. And the reason I want to do this is let's talk about Intel AMX. Now, Intel AMX is something that Intel has been working on. And frankly, there's like, you know, AVX 512, cool for HPC workloads and some other workloads. Then there's things like the NNI and all that kind of stuff, which were really kind of like designed to start doing that inference. And then AMX, um, Intel AMX, we, we've tested this previously. And this is an awesome core feature for Intel that really increases performance by a huge margin. So if you are talking about inference on Intel CPUs, you need to be talking about AMX. And in some ways, this is one of the reasons that you do see a lot of AI systems with Intel CPUs. But there's another reason. I just had this explained to me from someone that runs a extremely large AI cluster that we might talk about soon on STH. But the reason that you use Intel CPUs in AI systems is because of the die configuration. With AMD, right, you have to go through the IO die to memory, you have to go through the IO die to your PCIe, to your cores, all that kind of stuff. Whereas with Intel, you have the memory controllers directly on the compute die, and then you have EMIB to kind of connect all of your tiles together. And that's just a little bit higher performance than what AMD is doing. And so even though Intel hadn't been able to compete directly on total core count, just the fact that their memory and I.O. subsystems were the way they are meant that they were able to compete very successfully in AI servers, especially like big NVIDIA HGX servers, because, well, they just had that die configuration. Of course, today is also the Intel Gaudi 3 AI accelerator launch. So if you want to use your Intel CPUs with your Gaudi 3 AI accelerators, you can do that too. Something that is really cool that Intel started doing that I'm very excited about is they started looking at something that is a concept that I think people that run servers will understand, but you know we kind of miss a lot of times in our benchmarking. This chart shows that if you have a 16 core vCPU VM like running, 
it actually runs at a pretty decent clip on the new chips. What they're doing is a little bit different than what you might expect, because this is not, hey, let's run one workload across the entire chip. Instead, what Intel is doing is they're taking a 16 vCPU VM, and they're saying, what's the performance of that? On the rest of the chip, what they're actually doing is they're running a whole bunch of eight vCPU VMs, allegedly running at 50% utilization. So they're kind of simulating a, what happens when you have some noisy neighbors in a real cloud scenario or a somewhat real cloud scenario and what happens to your vCPU or your VM performance. Now, let's face it, a lot of these high core count CPUs are being used in virtualization clusters and cloud clusters, all kinds of stuff like that where you have multiple VMs running on the same hardware. That matters because you know as well as I know that a lot of folks are running vCPUs at like, you know, 15% or, you know, their VMs at like 15% utilization, 10%, 5%, some people less than that. And maybe they're just, they just need a lot of memory and they need a little bit of CPU performance every once in a while, but vast majority of the time, they're not really running at 100%. And so if you look at a modern CPU, this is something that we uh, created, I think, for the Sierra Forest launch that Intel is kind of adopting here, is that there are these systems out there that are running very disparate, like work or loads or at least loads on their different VMs and they're running those all at the same time. So what this says is, hey, look, you can go and max this thing out at 500 watts per processor, fine. But when you run at a, you know, say 40 to 70 ish, kind of that like middle of the road utilization, which is extremely common on CPUs in the cloud or just frankly in a lot of different instance types. Well, you know, that is where you're gonna see that 40 to 70% utilization. And when you get there, you're not just getting more performance, you get way more performance per watt. And since we're on the subject of power, let's just talk about that real quick. Uh, these CPUs definitely use 500 watts pop. Uh, and if you think that's a lot, just remember, um, we've already shown on the STH main site that AMD is gonna be doing the same thing. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this generation think 500 watts per CPU is kind of like the top end. But on the other hand, Intel has a whole bunch of other processors that can go lower in the TDP SKU stack. Now, of course, with all these videos, I like to have key lessons learned, and this is simple. Guys, welcome back to Intel. Just frankly, the fact that Intel can compete now with AMD on a core per core basis for the high performance P cores, I think is absolutely awesome. And again, while we're talking about the high end of the SKU stack here, there's a ton more going on. We have the lower core count, fewer memory channel, uh, you know, P core SKUs that I'm uh, very excited about. The R1S SKUs, I think that's awesome. Having 136 PCIe Gen 5 lanes for Xeon 6, like I can't wait for that. The other thing though, is that Sierra Forest is, um, you know, very competitive with modern ARM processors like Ampere 1 at 144 cores. And when they go to 288 cores, well, um, they're definitely gonna be extremely competitive with uh, future 256 core uh, Ampere processors, right? So with this generation of processors, Intel has gone from basically being behind and just saying, hey, you have to use acceleration or accelerators to even be in the same ballpark as AMD or better. Uh, now they can say, oh no, we can go core for core with these guys. The other thing they can do is they can go to the ARM guys and say, hey, we can do, if you don't wanna do SMT or hyper threading, you just wanna have physical cores, like we can go and kind of match those core counts. And that's especially when we get Sierra Forest AP, that's gonna be a big thing. And so, you know, I think that Intel's overall SKU stack with Xeon 6 is huge, but for everything kind of below the top end, it's super interesting now. At the same time, I have to say, I do wish that we were in Q1 2025 where all of the rest of the Xeon 6 goodness was there because I think that is when the Xeon 6 series gets really interesting. And as a fun key takeaway, here is what Clearwater Forest, the next generation all e-core CPUs on Intel 18A looks like. Intel brought one of these to the event up in Oregon that we went to a couple weeks ago. And uh, well, this is your next gen, like big daddy, awesome, super high core count CPU that I'm very, very, very excited for. And hey guys, this is the first time that Intel has led AMD in raw core count since the Naples Skylake generation back in 2017. So this is a huge deal guys. And I'd love to hear what you guys think throughout this. So if you do have thoughts, put them down in the comments, but just know I'm very impressed with these parts thus far. And hey guys, I hope you like this look at Intel Xeon 6. If you did like this, uh, you know, send it to your friends and colleagues, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.